Who's Little Toasty? Heat index of 102 or more. I was out in the zoo yesterday in it. Heat index of 104 in St. Louis, by the way. But my toddlers are worth it, celebrating a fourth birthday. So first of all, I just want to start by saying I am so thankful that each and every one of you is here. I know that Thursday sometimes is a hard night. I know that for some of you this week has been a really ugly week. It is that point in the semester that there isn't really such a thing as easy anymore and grades are coming back and some of those may be even uglier than you had anticipated. I am thankful that you are here. And for those of you that have had a good week, I celebrate that with you. And for those of you that have had a rough week, I grieve that with you. 24 hours, the weekend will be here. Take a breath. That being said, I also know there's some people who aren't here. I want you to take a moment and look around and think about some of those people that maybe aren't here. Maybe they had way too much homework, or they're sick, or maybe they're on co-op, or they had to work. So I want you to pull out your phone, and I want you to text that person or persons and say, hey, I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you, and in a few minutes or a few seconds, we're gonna stop and I'm gonna let you actually take time to pray for that person for a second. Maybe it's a person that you've been inviting to Catalyst for a while and they keep not saying yes. I want you to text them right now. For real. And I see those of you not getting your phone. And it doesn't have to be wish you were at Catalyst. It can simply be, hey, I know that you're having a rough night. I'm praying for you. Okay, go ahead and pray for that person. God, I want to thank you for an opportunity for us to be here tonight and to study your word. God, I thank you that no matter how hard life may be, um, how difficult situations may be, or how bleak things may look, um, that you are not dependent on what my day looks like, that the truth about your greatness and your perfection is not hindered or enhanced by me or my situation because you are so much greater and so much bigger. And Father, I ask that in this moment that you would shut out the frustrations, the worries, the fears, or the distractions so that we could hear your word unhindered. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So confession, version defeated me again. It didn't, it's there. My phone did something wrong. Yay, Ryan problem solved. You can find it on version after all. I swear, I tried to access it on my phone like five minutes ago and I texted Mo. It did it again, but it didn't, so yay. So you can find notes and verses for tonight on version. You go to the menu on the bottom right and you find events. You click this, you can save it if you want to refer back to it, cool. But as always, this is my favorite way to read scripture. So if you've got your physical Bible, go ahead and open to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So we've been knee deep in 1 Corinthians for a while. Um, this is a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. I know we kind of give you a summary each week, but I think it's important to remember. This is a letter where Paul was putting out some fires. There was some issues at the church in Corinth. There's some issues in Paul's relationship with this church in Corinth, and he's trying to address some of these things. Um, the Corinthian church also no longer highly regarded Paul. He wasn't exactly in their top five favorite people. Um, they were pretty frustrated with him, and you can sense that in a lot of the tone of what Paul writes. And especially in chapter four, we're going to uncover a lot of that. But in chapters one, two, and three, Paul is really setting the stage for the rest of the book of 1 Corinthians. See, in chapter 1, it's his introduction, his hello, and his, hey, 
I know you don't really like me, but how about you focus on the message over the messenger, um, like Nathaniel taught us. And he's also talking about, you know, Christ and him crucified is the thing that matters most. So I want you just to remember Christ. Like, above all things, remember Christ. Because in Christ is true wisdom, even though you may think this otherworldly wisdom is awesome and Christ may seem foolish, Christ is what matters. And you may have all of these issues of division and disunity, but Christ is the thing that will bring unity. So you need to remember these things before you hear the rest of what I have to say. And see, Paul also had something important to say to his audience in the rest of the text, but he knew they weren't going to be really receptive to what he had to say. They weren't an incredibly willing audience. And so he's asserting himself in chapter 4 as an apostle. And he's like, okay, guys, like, you really need to listen to what I have to say. And you really need to humble yourselves and get off your high horse so that you can receive the instruction from God. Because in the rest of this book, he's going to talk about their sexual deviancy. He's going to talk about the reasons that they're having a lack of unity. He's going to talk about how they're supposed to handle marriages. He's going to talk about their problems with idolatry. But before he can address all of these super personal things in kind of a public way to the church, he's going to remind them, hey, you may not like me, but you've got to remember that I am speaking on God's behalf to you. See, chapter 4 is Paul's deep breath before plunging headlong into some really hard subjects. And embedded in this, he addresses their relationship because he wants them to embrace this message. But I also wonder if part of it was Paul trying to remind himself, because I don't know about you, but I'm not always excited about hard conversations. Sometimes they're kind of intimidating, and I can try to talk myself out of having these very necessary conversations. And so I wonder if Paul saying this was also him reminding himself, no, I really need to talk about these things with you, and here's why. Saying hard things is hard, and doing hard things is hard. And this is when we walk into 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Read with me verses 1 through 5. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ. I'm going to pause for a second. So when he's talking about servants of Christ here, usually this word that's also equated with the word minister, doulos, is just talking about like a servant, okay? But he uses a very different word here that's actually interpreted as under rower. So you think of those like old school ships where they had people rowing underneath. Paul is saying he is that kind of servant. He's saying, I am like the bottom of servants. And really the only thing I'm concerned about is rowing the direction that God tells me to. All the other things that are going on, I don't really care about because I am an under rower for God. His desire, his goal, his purpose is the only thing that really matters to me. So when he says that as a servant of Christ, and then he says as stewards of the mysteries of God, when he says stewards here, a steward was actually the highest of servants in someone's house. This is the person who is in charge of the whole household. The steward had great responsibility, and his responsibility was to know and to execute the will of his master. It was to help guide and lead all the rest of the servants to do what pleased the master. And also, as a steward, came great responsibility. Because if he mishandled the affairs of his master, he was the one that was going to suffer the consequences for it, because he was the one who was supposed to know. And so when Paul says that I am a steward of the mysteries of God, that's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, like, God has put me in this position above you because I am responsible to him for how I lead and handle the affairs of his house. So when he's getting ready to launch into the rest of 1 Corinthians, he wants them to remember, I only care about what he asks of me because he's the one I am responsible to. But I'm going to handle the affairs of his house the way that he tells me to because I'm accountable to him. And you guys have been placed under my authority. And then it says of the mysteries of God. Because see, Paul couldn't just hand the church the Bible, right? Because he's writing the letters that will be our New Testament. And so he's writing this. He's handing them the mysteries of God. And then he goes on in verse 2 and says, Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. What is he talking about here? And I'll be honest, that's a verse that sometimes gives me pause. It's like, hold on, aren't we supposed to hold ourselves accountable? What Paul is saying here is we have a tendency to either be one too lenient with ourselves. We make excuses or justifications about why we can do something. Or we're too hard on ourselves. 
And Paul knows that he has a tendency to do one of those two things. So he says, I'm not even judging myself. It's for God to be the one to judge me because I know that he is going to be neither too hard nor too lenient with me. He says in verse 4, For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes. Sorry, I had to turn the page. Who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So he's also reminding them, and also don't judge too prematurely. Like you only see a small piece of the picture. There's so much more to see and to know here. And you're making these assessments and you're making these judgments on just a small thing. Now, there's something interesting that I found when I was going through and reading about these. Um, And Paul's talking about, and the first point I want you to hear is that Paul is saying, I serve God first. Before I serve anyone else, I serve God first. And we actually see this echoed in multiple of Paul's letters. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, uh, will someone read that for me? If you have the app open, it should be there. And I think this is, again, not just a reminder to the church, but a reminder to himself, I'm not here for your approval. I'm here for the approval of God. Will someone read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4? So yet again, this is the third church that Paul is saying, hey, I do these things, I share the gospel, I do this because God has entrusted me. It's again that idea of stewardship. He's entrusted me to share this, and he's the one who tests my hearts. So as much as you may not like what I'm going to have to say in the rest of this letter, realize that I serve God first. Someone Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work heartily as See, Paul didn't really care what they thought about him. Just as long as he uh, represented his master well and rightly. You know, and I wish I could say that more about myself. Sometimes I get so caught up with thinking what other people are going to think about me. Or before I have these hard conversations, I freak myself out and make myself a little sick because I know I need to tell this truth to someone, but I'm afraid they're going to shut me out because they're going to want nothing to do with me after this. And then, like Paul, I have to remind myself I serve God first. And I have to do what he tells me to do first. See, stewards of the mysteries of God, he is responsible to God. He is reminding people of his special apostolic appointment, one that could not be claimed by many. And he's like, hey, like, you may not like me, but God has placed this mantle of authority over me. He has placed me as this head steward. So you really have to listen, even though you don't like the messenger. When Paul says this at the very beginning in verse 1, he says, this is how you should regard us. He is saying, regard us as focused servants that are accountable to God above all else. But then down in 1 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7, Paul tells them, he says, and you also need to remember to give God credit. See, they weren't. They were taking credit for themselves. Verse 6 and 7 says, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one another or one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And then you received it. Why do you boast as if you did not receive it? See, He goes on later, much, much later in the book of 1 Corinthians, and he's talking about spiritual gifts, and he's talking about the um, ability to prophesy and all of these different things. And so I wonder if this is the precursor, and he's like, hey, FYI, God gave you those things. So quit being proud about those things. Quit having arrogance in those things because God gave it to you in the first place, and you're taking credit that belongs to God. You're stealing his glory. So Paul says, I serve God first, and we need to be careful that we are always giving God credit. C.S. Lewis says, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you can't see something that's above you. Will someone read Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2? All 
That one always gives me a gut check because, see, I think that my motives are right. I think I'm doing things for the right reason. But then when I bring it before God and it, like I totally get put in a spiritual timeout because I was not doing it the way I was supposed to. Can somebody please read Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10? See, that verse was encouraging to Paul. He took comfort in it. But I don't know about you. It doesn't necessarily encourage me as it does make me want to, like, kind of get my affairs in order a little bit better and behave a little bit more responsibly with the word of God and the things that he lays on my heart. And I want to ask you, too, how comfortable are you with the Lord searching your heart and testing your mind? How certain are you that you're going to be found doing things the way that he asks and commands of you to do? See, Paul, he humbles their pride, and he's like, hey, you're taking credit for things you shouldn't take credit for. You need to be sure that you're giving God the credit. And he moves on in verse 8 through 13, and he says, you need to value God most. They're having value in the wrong things. Will someone read verses 8 through 13 for me? The Corinthian church was falling into the mindset of the health and prosperity gospel. And Paul is shining a spotlight of truth on this issue and this heart problem because the church was not valuing God most. I love this quote, and it says, Jesus does give us abundant life, but his abundant life is independent of circumstances. And I love that truth because his abundant life isn't dependent upon how good you do at the career fair next week. His abundant life isn't dependent upon your GPA or that test result that you're dreading to get back or that you got back and wish that you hadn't. His abundant life isn't dependent on your physical health and your financial stability or your parents' marriage or your relationship with your siblings or the way that you can't stand your roommate or this relationship that's broken that you wish wasn't or this relationship you wish that would happen that just won't. His abundant life isn't dependent on those things. Paul's going through and he's saying, you seem to think that you have everything. And I was reading in a commentary, it said, this is actually a really sarcastic part of scripture. Paul's telling them, he's like, oh, you guys are rich. You've got it all. You have everything. Would that you were ruling so that we could rule with you. You know, we're like men sentenced to death, but look at everything that you have. Like you're up on this high mountain. We're down in this pit. And he's telling them, he's like, we're fools for Christ's sake. Oh, but you're so wise. You know everything, don't you? We're weak. We're so weak. But you're strong. I mean, you're really strong. You've got it all together. You're held in honor, and we're held in disrepute. And this, as I'm reading through this, it really reminds me of the story of the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 31. And I wonder if that is what's rolling through Paul's mind as he writes this letter, and he's telling them, like, hey, you're not valuing God most. See, the church wanted to follow Jesus and even Paul's teaching as long as it wasn't to that extreme, as it wasn't to that place, as it wasn't to that extent. Okay, God, I'll be obedient to you as long as you don't ask me to give up this thing. I will put you first in all areas of my life as long as it's not that area, right? Don't ask me to sacrifice this relationship. Don't ask me to change majors. Don't ask me to pursue ministry instead of engineering, You know, don't ask me to get an engineering degree and then go to a third world country and work to serve the least of these. You know, don't ask me to give up this that I love. Don't ask me to sacrifice that. I'll follow you to the ends of the earth. 
except I love my husband dearly. He is my favorite person. And then our toddlers are my other favorite persons. I call my husband my hairy man beast. He's six foot four of awesome hairiness. And he kind of looks like a gorilla, and I love it. He'll be speaking in a few weeks, and you can tell him that I'd call him that. Um, but so he is a youth pastor at our church, and he loves teenagers, and he loves pushing teenagers towards Jesus. And we were at this youth conference, and we were worshiping, and while we were there at this conference, our missions minister, Scott Robinson, he calls Ben. He says, hey, yo, I'm taking a missions trip to India, but some people backed out, and I want you to go. And my husband says, no thanks, they have cobras, because he's really terrified of snakes. And I personally have had a passion for India since I was like six years old. I don't know why my mom let me read Voice of the Martyrs when I was six, but she did. And I had a passion for persecuted believers in India since then. And so when Ben told me, I said, no. I said, honey, I said, did you pray about it? He was like, no. I was like, okay. I said, if you pray about it and God tells you no, I submit to that. I said, but you didn't pray about it, so I can't submit to that. I just can't. I said, so you pray about it, and then if God tells you, yes, I'm going to. And he's like, I'll pray about it, you know, but that, like, really skeptical. I'll pray about it, but it's a no. And so we were at the conference, and there was this worship service going on that night, and they were singing the song, where you go, I'll go, where you send me, I will follow. And then Ben's, like, in this super worship, worshipful place, and then he realizes what he's saying. And then he turns to me and says, we're going to India in like a month and a half. <laughs> and I was so excited and he was so nervous. But would you know, my, my husband, who had never been on a missions trip before, who had never been on an international missions trip before, has now led teenagers on a trip to India since the time that we went together. And he's taking teenagers to India, uh, or he's taking teenagers to Kenya for spring break. Like not in town and where there's things worse than cobras, okay? Like lions and things and no telephones or hospitals nearby. And then he's taking another trip to Haiti. And then he's taking another trip to Ireland because he said yes to Jesus without exception. He said, I really will go where you ask me to go, even if they happen to have cobras and I'm not okay with that. Because he wanted to love God and value God most. And this is what Paul's trying to get the attention of the people that are here. And he's saying, listen, we're foolish and you're wise. But we talked about this a little earlier. The foolishness of Christ is the wisdom that matters. He says, you know, sure, we're weak and you guys are strong. You have all of this political power and authority and prestige. But we have our eyes set on eternity. You know, we, we suffer all of this disgrace and you have all of this honor. But what is it really worth apart from Christ? What are titles and prestige and position when you're sacrificing your relationship with Christ for that? He says, yeah, we're hungry. We're thirsty. And they look down like, oh, but there's so many good things to have. Paul, you don't have to be hungry or thirsty. You don't have to be poor. And he says, I'm violently treated for the gospel. I'm a homeless. I work hard with my hands doing physical labor while you're sitting comfortable with servants to care for you. See, they saw Paul as one of those Jesus followers that were dispensable. But that's not going to make things okay. Because Jesus doesn't ask us to only be this kind of follower. He wants us to be an all-in, value God most kind of follower. See, when this text, it's really interesting in verse 13, and it says, We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I mean, it sounds kind of gnarly, but when you dig in the trenches of the text, it gets pretty cool and even more gnarly. So apparently, part of their culture, <clears throat> when there was famine or when there was disease, they would take the sick, the super poor, and they would literally like scrape them out of society and cast them aside and just let them die. And it was their way of purging their culture and their community to reset things so that maybe the disease and the famine would be over. So Paul is saying, I am, we have become and are still like the scum or the off scrapings of society to scrape the slate clean. That's how people view us because they don't think we have anything to contribute or to offer. But I choose to value God most, regardless of what man thinks of me. 
The image of success and power is not necessarily the image of Christ-likeness. He says, when people curse us, when they speak ill to us, or when they're harsh with us, we bless them. And I want to ask you guys, what does that look like in a conversation today? You know, maybe you're talking about your faith and someone's telling you that you're stupid. And how could you possibly be an intelligent person and believe in Christianity and believe in a God that created everything? And in those moments, do we get defensive and do we get hostile and let it incite a frustrating conversation? Or do we bless them instead and say, you know what? I know it can be hard to understand, but I would love to meet with you and talk about this more. Can we set like a weekly time to discuss this? Uh, I don't know if I have time for that. Well, I'll be praying for you anyway. And when I see you, I'll try to have something ready for a topic for us to discuss. See, when they curse you, do you bless them? When persecuted, he says, we endure. We keep going. And I know I talk about our friends in India all the time. They said, but don't pray for our persecution to end. Pray that our faith will endure because they knew that that persecution was tilling the grounds to make it fertile soil to receive the gospel of Christ. Paul says when people slander us, when they tell lies about us, when they speak ill of us, we encourage them. When someone tells you that you are a hypocrite, and that you obviously aren't a very good Christian because of decisions that you make. You know, I'm a work in progress, and I appreciate you calling me out on that because I know that there's more ways that I can improve. Thank you. What would conversations look like instead of getting defensive when people slander us that we just turn around and encourage them? Paul says when we're discarded, we press on. Okay, you don't want anything to do with us? We'll continue to share the gospel with other people anyway. And then Paul says in verses 14 through 21, obey God wholly. See, Paul in this letter is saying, this is my full obedience to God. I'm not comfortable about saying a lot of these things. I know you don't even like me, and this probably isn't going to win me any friends. But I'm going to obey God wholly. Read with me as I read verses 14 through 21. I do not write these things to make you ashamed but to admonish you as my beloved children. Hopefully there's a cute picture in your phone that you can look at of my beautiful little girls that I adore with my whole heart. That was taken before preschool the other day, and Darcy was in a really bad mood because the grass and her backpack, and I was looking at her, and I think I didn't put enough syrup on her waffles and... All of these other things. So I was being really stern with her because I really wanted this picture of the girls like in our yard with like natural like lighting and all of this stuff. And so I was like, Darcy, go stand over there, please. And she turns to me and she says, are you mad at me, mommy? Like, My heart breaks. And this actually happens a lot when I have to be firm with her. She's like, are you mad? No, baby. And I get down on her level and I wrap her up in my arms. I'm like, Honey, there is nothing you could do that would make me not love you. I was like, I am so proud of you, and I love you so much. But I need you to do this right now because, and usually it's not just for a picture. It's something more important, like, hey, brush your teeth so that they don't fall out of your head. <laughs> so, but I sit down. I'm like, no, baby, I'm not mad at you. But I love you, and I'm your mommy. And so I have to make sure that you do these things. So Paul's really intense and sarcastic, and I imagine getting a little bit frustrated in his pen or quill or whatever is flying as he's writing this letter. And then he says, I don't write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, he knows that they have many spiritual leaders that are trying to pour into this church and to lead these people. He says, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. He says, you may be my angry kids and you may not like me a whole lot right now. But I am your spiritual father. He says, I urge you then, be imitators of me. Why that? That's such an awkward text. Be imitators of me. Who says that? We always say, imitate Christ, don't imitate me. I'm a fallen person. They didn't have the Bible. And so Paul's saying, I'm living out the gospel the best I can. So imitate me. And then if you think about it, he had just said he was everything that they didn't want to be in their society. And he's saying, imitate me. Yes, because I want you to obey God 
holy. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. See, Paul knew that this church needed a lot of help. They needed somebody to be able to be with them, and he knew that he had other places he had to go to continue to teach the gospel. And so he sends one of his favorite people, Timothy, to this church that's really broken and full of a lot of really hostile people. And he says, listen to him. He says, some of you are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon, and if the Lord wills, I will find out, not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. See, I know sometimes, like, maybe when you are disobedient and your parents are like, I'm coming home. Are you really coming home right now? Like, or can I, like, get away with trying to clean this up? And then when you hear the car pull in the driveway, like, <gasps> no, I better, like, take care of it all, like, right now, like, really, really fast. And Paul's saying, you may not think I'm actually coming, but I'm coming to you, and it is up to you how I'm going to come to you as a father. He says, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk but in power. He's saying, you may talk a big game, and you may think you have all this authority, but we'll see what authority you have when I come with the Spirit of God as an apostle of Christ and speak truth. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? See, I can come as this really angry parent that needs to, like, whip you and put you in timeout over and over and over again until you get this point. Or I can come as a gracious parent on your level, speaking tenderly to you with reproof. Paul is saying, it's your choice. But I'm coming as a parent who loves you because I am the steward in charge of this and responsible wholly to God. So he cared more about their relationship with God than his own comfort. And I got to ask you, how often am I more worried about my relationship with God and someone else's relationship with God instead of their relationship with me? Because when I see sin in some people's life, even yours, because you guys can be kind of scary sometimes, I don't always want to go and be like, hey, yo, that conversation was actually gossip and you really need to stop. Or... You know, this, that's actually a click, and it's really, like, making it hard for people to feel connected and engaged. Or, you know what, when you're doing this, that's actually kind of cheating. Or, when you do this, that's actually really not okay, and Jesus has some words to say about that. Because we need to be wholly obedient to God. In a devotion about obedience, Rick Warren writes, Obedience means doing whatever God asks without reservation or hesitation. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. Wholehearted obedience is done joyfully with enthusiasm. Now, there is a difference in joy and happiness. I'm not always happy about confronting you with your sin. But I will say I do it joyfully because I love you enough to make you hate me if it's going to get you right with God. I would rather you want nothing to do with me for the rest of your life if you have a super passionate relationship with Jesus. I mean, hopefully we can be friends. But it is more important to me to be able to encourage, guide, and motivate you in a healthy relationship with God first. See, there's some passages that I put in there that show us full, willing, and immediate obedience. Genesis 6.22 talks about Noah, and it says he did all that God commanded him, and he looked like a fool to a whole lot of people. But he was willing to be obedient to God Holy and completely. Psalm 100 verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Psalm 119, 33 says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Because see, sometimes what God asks us to do isn't really convenient and it isn't necessarily fun. But I want to challenge you guys out of these things that Paul teaches. Serve God first because he wants to be your priority. Not a secondary thing. He wants to be the first thing. He wants to be the thing that all other things are funneled through. And give God credit because he wants you to acknowledge him with humility. It's okay to say, you know what? Yes, God has blessed me with these things, but it's him and it's not me. And value God most because he wants to turn your value system on its head. He wants you to embrace the foolishness of the world because it is the wisdom of the cross. I want to encourage you to obey God wholly. See, God wants all of us, not just the parts of us that we want to give him. He doesn't want to camp out in your living room. He doesn't just want to be a visitor in your house. He wants to abide there. In fact, he wants your home of your heart to be his dwelling place, where he is completely and totally welcome. 
as the worship team comes up, I want you guys to meditate on this because, see, the theme in all of this, the common denominator in all of these things that Paul is saying, he says, I want you to do hard things for Jesus because being obedient to God is hard. Putting God first and giving him credit is hard, but it is so worth it. And so I want to encourage you guys as you are seeking to obey God in all things, that you do hard things for Jesus. Please pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, um, God, I just want to thank you for the truth of your word. I want to thank you that Paul, even though sometimes he may have been uncomfortable, that he was willing to always preach your word. Um, God, I ask that we would be motivated to be uncomfortable for you, that we would be willing to be completely obedient to you even when it's not the thing that we really want, that we wouldn't question what it is you want us to do, um, that we would be able to react and respond um, the way that Jesus would. In Jesus' name.